There's a quote that we've been looking at a couple of times this week and I'd like to, to look at it now and I'd like to look at it from another angle. And, and the quote is found in Education, page 100. And it says, the same power that upholds nature is working also in man. The same great laws that guide alike star and atom control human life. The laws that govern the action of the heart, regulating the current of flow to the body, are the laws of the mighty intelligence that has jurisdiction of the soul. From him all life proceeds. Only in harmony with him can be found its true sphere of action. To all objects of his creation, the conditions are the same. A life exercised in harmony with the Creator's will, a life sustained by receiving life from the Creator. This is the last sentence. Please take note. To transgress his law, whether it be physical, whether it be mental or whether it be moral, is to place oneself out of harmony with the universe to invite discord, anarchy and ruin. Look at those three laws. Physical law, we've been looking at physical law all week. Moral law, the dictionary calls the Ten Commandments the great moral code of ethics. But what are the mental laws? I'd never heard of mental laws. And so I began a journey of discovery to find out what are the mental laws. And as I <coughs> investigated, especially in the book Mind, Character and Personality, there's book and one, book one and book two, there's a section in there on the laws and that is where I first saw that quote and it's also where she lists the laws of the mind. What I have done is I've refined these laws. I used to work as a, when I say refined, I've just summarised them. Mm -hmm. When I used to work as a psychiatric nurse, I didn't see people get better. I saw the same people come and go. And sometimes uh, they'd come back with even more cuts on their arms. One girl, it was like a train track, the amount of time she'd tried to commit suicide. And what's the definition of insanity? It's to do what you've always done and expect different results. I was not a Christian when I worked as a psychiatric nurse, but I still observed these things and thought to myself, there must be something better. And so a few years later, I discovered the great God of heaven and I surrendered my life to him. And as I began to study his ways, the way God works, and I saw that the way God works is to work with this amazing organism that he has made. And surely there's no difference when you come to the brain. And so when I saw the laws that govern the brain, and when I saw that to transgress his law is to place oneself out of harmony with the universe, to, dis to invite discord, anarchy and ruin, the equation I came to was, it is broken law that brings disease. And when we read in page 127 of the Ministry of Healing, where Ellen White says, disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that arise because of a violation of the laws of health. And as I go through these mental laws today, you will start to see that mental health requires the keeping of the physical laws, the mental laws, and yes, the moral laws. So let's do an assessment of the mental laws. The first law must always and ever be the law of cause and effect. Newton's third law of motion states that to every action there is an equal and an opposite reaction. Sir Isaac Newton has been credited with the discovery of that law, but it was already written in the Bible. And in Galatians 6 verse 7, the Bible says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that he shall also reap. And also in Proverbs 26 verse 2, the Bible says, The curse causeless shall not come. In other words, no, no effect comes without a cause. 
And Job 29.16 says, The cause I knew not, I searched out. And this week, as we've been going through the body, as we've been going through what causes illness and what actually brings about wellness and harmony in the body, we have been touching on the cause and effect. And we've been using page 127 where Ellen White says, in case of sickness, the cause. <laughs> Number one, the cause. But what about mental illness? And so with mental illness, absolutely, there is always a cause. So let's have a look at a couple of effects. Because remember, they are effects. Panic attacks. Panic attack is effect. It is not a cause. So what's the cause of a panic attack? Usually a panic attack happens when a highly stressful situation arises. But what I have found that if the human body is well hydrated, well fed, well exercised, well slept, no stimulants, sunshine, having fresh air and trusting in the great God of heaven, the, the panic attacks certainly ease. And so with, uh, with one man, and he was the Seventh-day Adventist pastor, and he told me he used to get panic attacks, so I'm immediately intrigued. I said, when did you get your first panic attack? He said, well, we were driving. It was a 16 drive from Mount Isa, right up the top, you know, in the Northern Territory where he was pastoring, <coughs> down all the way to uh, a little town where his parents lived that's just north of Sydney. I said, oh, tell me about your trip. He said, well, we drove at night because it's easier. So what's happening here? One law's gone down. In the car all day and all night, no exercise. Having a little bit of fast food because it's easy. Uh, not much proper food going in. I uh, didn't drink a lot of water because didn't want to keep stopping. And he doesn't usually do this, but he did start to drink a little bit of coffee to help him keep awake. Can you see what's happening here? One by one, the laws are going down. He said when he arrived, he said it was just a silly little thing that happened, but he just lost it and he started to panic and he started to shake. His skin felt like it was electricity. He was perspiring. He, he didn't know what was happening with him. They were, his family was worried and took him to hospital and the doctor said he's having a panic attack and gave him some, what we, I, I don't know the name of drugs here, but Valium, it's a Valium, is a, a relaxant to calm him down. Now, when that happened to Ben, it made a very strong effect. So here's our nerve cell. Here are the dendrites or the receiving stations. And here is the arm that comes out called the axon. And here are the little filaments into the boutons. Here is the next nerve cell. And what happened when this happened to Ben, it made a strong pathway. You know when we say something has a profound effect on it, on us, we never forget it. Very strong pathway. And these are physical pathways that science has shown develop in our brain. So the next time a stressful situation arose, the same thing happened. He went down that pathway. It's not a, he just went down there. We are creatures that go down the path of least resistance. Isn't that true? And so this was happening several times. What's happening to the pathway? Repetition is the mother of retention and repetition deepens the impression. <laughs> They're sayings that show those pathways. He said the worst happened when he was in a plane flying to Mount Isa and he said, and the plane went through a, into a cloud. And he said he doesn't know why, but that triggered a panic attack. He was holding onto the arms of the, of the chair. He was shaking like a leaf. The perspiration's dripping out of him. The air hostess said to his wife, what's happening? She said, he's, he's having a panic attack. She nodded and she rang through to the hospital and said, can we have an ambulance at the at the airport, as soon as we land, they took him to the hospital. The doctors immediately gave him something to calm him down. 
The wife rang the father. And the father I know quite well. He's also an Adventist pastor. He's in his 70s now. Ben's in his, when this happened, was late 30s. And when she told John, the father, what had happened, he said, leave it with me. And he rang a lady who he knew had had panic attacks. He knew that she'd been even hospitalised. They got so severely. And as she's sitting in this psych hospital and watching what's happening, she decided there was only one way to get out. She had to take control of what was happening in her body. She got out, she conquered her panic attacks. And he rang her and said, can you go and visit my son? I'll pay for the flight. Can you please go and sit next to his bed and tell him how you did it? And what she said was, you may not realise it when the panic starts, but she said, you actually have a choice. You have a choice. He was immediately intrigued because he was not happy with what was happening to him. She said, you do have a choice. And she said, and the first time you choose not to go with this panic attack, it's incredibly hard. It's very hard. It's going to take everything in you. She said, most people, don't, they don't realise they do have a choice. So she, he said it was hard, it was incredibly hard. So the next time he had one, he was by himself and he thought, great, I'm by myself. He prayed, he said, Father in heaven, I know you don't want me like this. I never realised I had a choice. And he battled it. <laughs> it was a battle because his limbic system, his thoughts and his feelings were going, panic! And he said... No. By the end of the battle, he was exhausted. <laughs> he came out of the room just. <laughs> and his wife said, what happened? He said, I've just had a battle. <laughs> he said, I've conquered it. Now, the first time he conquered it, that made another pathway. But can you see what's still the, the strongest pathway? When he heard my lecture, he said to me, you have taken it one step further. You have shown me what caused it. It was a breaking of those laws. How many, how many Adventists, when you mention the laws of health, almost roll their eyes? <laughs> oh, yeah, we know them. We, we, we know them. But how many live them? And that's why in school this week, I wanted to take you very, very deep and show the absolute full effect of this. Because God said they're the true remedies. Mm. He said, when I'm well hydrated, when I'm eating well, <laughs> if I miss a, will, a, a meal, he said, I'm vulnerable. And when we go on our journey through the gut, you'll discover routine and rhythm is vital for proper body function. The same thing at the same time, every day. I raised six children, and then when they're half raised, I've got two more. <laughs> and you know what I noticed? They were happy when everything was done at the same time, every day. I learned order and routine as a nurse. I think it's in me a little bit naturally anyway. And way out in the rainforest, you, you, could, you could set your clock to when we had breakfast to when we started school. Now, it didn't matter if we were five minutes early or five minutes late. You, know, you don't make it a stress, but I just found that if I kept to a routine, I fitted everything in the day. And that's why I did it. Because imagine at one point I've got a baby and a two-year-old and a four-year-old and I've got the six-year-old and the nine-year-old and the 11-year-old in school. So I, I had to have a routine there. I had to have a routine there, and it worked. And I hear my children telling other people that they love their home school, and I hear other homeschool kids hating it. And when I look at the way they did it, school one day, school not the next, uh, one day start at eight, one day start at 10, and I believe this is, this is why, because God is our God of order. And he created our body to run according to a certain order. 
And we've quoted this a few times. It's not the odd day you do it and it's not the, not the odd day you don't. <laughs> it's your habitual daily tendency. Ben conquered his panic attacks. The first one was the hardest. <laughs> but once he'd conquered that one, he had confidence that he could do this. How long did it take before the new pathway became the strong one? And he refused to go down that old pathway. What Ben did was he rewired his brain. And the research shows that you can be rewiring your brain right up until the day we die. 21 days. 21 days, and we looked at this to form a new ha habit. Students, do you remember how long before it's in cement? 60 days and then it's in cement. So when I went to give health meetings in Ben's church, he had conquered his panic attacks maybe two years before this. And he said, anyone that has panic attacks in my congregation, I spend time with them. And I show them how they can do it. He said, but I'll tell you something that you'll find interesting. He said, a year after I'd conquered the panic attacks, he said, I've decided to learn to fly. I wanted to be a pilot like my father. Mm -hmm. He said, the first lesson, we flew into clouds. <laughs> <laughs> he said, there was a slight flutter. He said, I threw my head back and I laughed. Mm -hmm. What does the Bible say? It's a wonderful principle for mental health. It says in Leviticus 17:22, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. So there was a, fl a slight flutter of his limbic system saying, panic, but he laughed. He said, I, I don't do that anymore. I don't go there anymore. <clears throat> For we all with open face, and we know the verse very beautifully. It's in, found in um, 2 Corinthians 3, and it's found about verse 14. For we all with open face, beholding in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Most people don't realise they have more control <coughs> over their behaviour, over what they do, than they think they do. What about depression? I've had people come to our retreat that have said to me, I've got depression. Do you know, you can't just get depression. You actually can't just get anything. There's a cause, there's always a cause. So what's the cause of depression? Dr. Neil Nedley in his book, Depression A Way Out, he says, lifestyle tragedy cannot cause depression. Isn't that good news? Some of the people that I, I've spoken to, what they've been through. We had one lady do our program. This is about 18 years ago. She was in her 70s, almost 80 at the time. She'd been in Poland when the war broke out. She lost every single member of her family, all her brothers, all her sisters, her parents, her aunts, her uncles, her cousins, everyone. She was the only survivor. Whoa, what a story. And if you wanted to know where this woman was, just follow the laughter. Just follow the laughter. She laughed all the time. Her daughters loved her so much that midweek they actually came and visited her. You would never, ever think that this woman had been through such heartache. You see, it's not what happens to us. It's what we do with it. It's what we do with what happens to us. Dr. Neil Nedley says, lifestyle tragedy cannot cause depression. Praise God. <laughs> he says, genetics cannot cause depression. And we looked at this, genetics may load the gun, but lifestyle pulls the trigger. You know what this means? Even if both our parents committed suicide, we need never go there. And yet many go there because they think they're going to go there. That's that limbic system, the thoughts and the feelings again. And Proverbs 23 verse 7 states, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Praise God that we can have control over those thoughts and feelings. It's found in uh, Psalm 16 
I think it's verse 7 where it says, I will bless the Lord hath, who hath given me counsel. My rains also instruct me in the night season. These are the rains. <laughs> These are the rains that, and who are they instructed by? Early in the morning, that divine appointment. Dr. Neil Nedley says there are over, over 100 causes of depression and he calls them hits. What are the hits? Lack of pure air, lack of sunshine, <laughs> caffeine, alcohol, refined sugar, drugs, mercury, chemicals. There's more hits, he calls them hits. Lack of sleep, that's a huge one. Lack of exercise. Lack of exercise means you're not getting that oxygen into the brain cells. Impoverished diet. Dehydration. Dehydration. That dehydrated brain can develop negative thought patterns. Fear. Worry. Anxiety. God says, I've not given you the spirit of fear, power, love, sound mind. A sound mind is a proper functioning of the prefrontal cortex. And that's what Ben did. He said, no, I'm not going to go there anymore. I'm not going down that pathway anymore. I'm shutting that door. What's the old saying? Where there's a will, there's a way. If you say you can, you will. And if you say you can't, you're right. You won't. <laughs> but give yourself time. Rome wasn't built in a day. Yeah? Ben gave himself time. How long will it take? Depends on how diligent you are to do what, you, what has to be done to conquer this. And so when someone comes to us wanting help with depression, the first thing we do is we check the air they're breathing. We get them to sit in the sun. We show them how to detox little by little from their caffeines, their alcohols, their cigarettes, etc., etc. We get them to go to bed earlier. We show them how to implement an exercise program. We show them how nourishing food can make a very big difference to brain function. We show them how to drink more water. We introduce them to the great God of heaven that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. That's where we start. And then we put the detective hat on to find out how do we get to this? Why did this happen? The second law brings us to the law of choice. Do you remember the little one letter word we've had in the corner? It is I that chooses. It is I that chooses what I do. It is I that chooses what I go into my body. Is it I that chooses what I think? Yeah. The devil can, can throw the thoughts in and what can we do with those thoughts? We can hold on to them or we can let them go. We can let them go. We have a choice. And there is one choice that I have found that frees us from heartache more than any other choice. It's the choice to forgive. Forgiveness is a very powerful choice. And I have seen many freed from physical illnesses, emotional illnesses, through forgiveness. But what most people don't realize is it's not a feeling. It's not a feeling. It is a choice. It is a mental choice. It is a principle. So when I was working with a young girl, she was 14. She'd been sexually abused by her father between the ages of six and nine. Surely the worst case of betrayal. She was bitter. What are we going to do with this? So I sat with her one day and I sat with her for two hours and I did not have two hours, but this was very important. I talked to her about the power of forgiveness. I said, forgiveness can cut the chains that bind you to painful past. Forgiveness can give you wings. It can give you freedom. And I memorized this from an old book. And if you love this, I'll write it down at the end of the lecture on the board. Forgiveness is the only prescription in the entire universe that has the power to break the chemical bonds of hostility, anger and hate. No wonder Jesus said 70 times 7. <laughs> when we don't forgive, it's like we're drinking the poison and hoping our abuser will die. 
just forgive. God says in Luke chapter 17, verse 1, it's impossible, but these offences will come because of choice, because some will choose wrong. He says, it's impossible, but these offences will come. But woe to him by whom they come. It will be better that a millstone was hung around his neck and him thrown into the deeper sea than him touch one of my little ones. And I use this verse when helping people who've been touched too early. And I said, you are the apple of God's eye. You are one of the little ones. Woe to him who touched you. Because you have a father and he's not happy. (laughs) You know, the Bible says, if if any man defile the temple of God, when someone touches a young person or even an older person who, who, who they have no right to touch, they defile themselves. When they touch that young child, They're not defiling the child. Who are they defiling? They're defiling themselves because that that person is a victim. They didn't choose for this to happen to them. And a lot of victims get that confused. Mm -hmm. So it's important to define that. They, They never chose this. And God cries when we cry. Some say, well, why didn't he come in and just stop it? Because he gave mankind choice. And the minute he uses force, that's not what his government is based on. His government is based on freedom. And what's the basis of freedom? Free choice. And it's not over yet. A judgment day is coming where all who have Defied the God of heaven will have to stand in front of him and answer for everything they've done. Yep. So leave it with him. He says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. He'll do a better job. Leave it with him. Our role is to walk away. So after sitting with this 14-year-old girl for two hours, she finally said, all right, I forgive. Hmm. What I did was I jumped up with the biggest smile on my face, shook a hand and said, congratulations. You've made probably one of the best decisions of your life. How could she feel like it? Some people say, well, did she really feel like it? Never say that. Because this decision has nothing to do with the feelings. Mm. She did it. She made that decision. I said, well done. That was a mighty decision. Hmm, she says. That afternoon she said, I'm feeling better about it. I said, you are experiencing a law of the mind and that law states that your words affect your feelings. While it is true that our feelings are expressed through our words, it is also true that our words affect our feelings. The next day she said, I don't feel like it today. Now remember, she's 14. Uh, Prefrontal cortex is only half developed. I said, no wonder you feel like that. You've just had a trigger, but you've forgiven. You're going to feel better soon. And she did. She's happily married now. She has a great sex life with her husband. How often can you say that about girls that have been touched? She has three little children. I believe that that decision that she made to forgive and leave it there. And what's the devil, what's the accuser of the brethren going to do? What are those fiery darts going to say? You haven't really forgiven. Look what he's done. No, no, you've forgiven. Forgiveness is like a strong line and your feelings are going to do that. They're not a good guide. (laughs) They go up and down like the wind. They're like a wild horse. They're like a wild horse. And if I say to a man, can you take this wild horse for a ride? He's only just been broken in. Half an hour. Comes back eight hours later. 
I say to the man, what happened? He said, well, the horse wanted to go here and it wanted to go over there. It wanted... And what, what's my answer? What do you think the reins are for? What do you think the bridle's for? <laughs> pull it in. We will often have to pull our thoughts and feelings in. Mm. Forgiveness is a powerful choice. And they might not feel like it that day. They might not feel like it the next day. But you know, they will feel like it eventually. Love is a choice. God gave us the choice to love him. And when we study the life of Jesus, our intellect, our reason and our judgment, we fall in love with him. One of my favourite stories is when Jesus is packed out in Desire of Ages. He and his disciples are walking out outside the city and he looks over and there's a funeral train and there's a young man lying on the, on the whatever they lie on the beer, is it? And the people are crying and the mother was behind crying and Jesus turned and the disciples thought, what's he going to do now? And Jesus went up and said, young man, arise. <laughs> he said, woman, your son. Oh, what a saviour. Mm? What a saviour. And you see the disciples, what's he going to do now? Where's he going now? It's just a funeral train. But what did he see? Is there a mother who was broke? Her only son. He, he could not walk past. <laughs> what a beautiful saviour. When we fall in love, we fall in love with character. And in John chapter 1 verse 14 it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld his glory, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. What was his glory? Merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin. It's not hard to love God when you see that. But remember there's a deceiver out there and he will try, that roaring lion will try anything to get your mind away from that. Your words affect your feelings, so be very careful on your words. The fourth law states that your words reveal your feelings. And you can't let them all out. The Bible says in Colossians 4 verse 6, let your speech be always with grace. You will always think it before you say it. Praise God. And you know the devil can't read our mind. So we have an edge. But that prefrontal cortex gets very weak when those laws are broken. I was uh, confronted many times as a mother with frustrating situations as always happens with children. <laughs> and I remember something happened to me once that I felt very bad about. I had the baby, I had the little toddler, and then my little girl, Emma, just six, just starting school. And I'm a novice, got the home school in, and I'm showing her a principal and she resisted me. I said, Em, it's just this simple. And she kept resisting me and I could feel my anger rising. And I just got my hand and I swept all the schoolwork off the table and onto the floor. Emma cries, baby cries, the toddler cries, I'm crying. And then the accuser of the brethren starts, is that right? What sort of a mother are you? as if you're ever going to teach, be able to teach. Oh, dear, does he come in? 
I praise God for that experience because I never did it again. <laughs> oh, the, the effect was so bad. <laughs> and God knew what was coming. A baby, a toddler, let's go further on, a six-year-old, <laughs> six of them. And I used to notice that sometimes baby's crying because the baby needs a nappy change and then the little two-year-old one has just scraped his, his knee and he's crying and then the four-year-old's trying to put the dress on the doll and it won't go on and then the six-year-old made a mistake and she's upset and how's she going to fix this and then the nine-year-old can't quite get this mathematical problem and it's, it's all at once. It's all at once. So you know what I'd do? Praise God for that terrible experience that I first had. So what I did was I just said, um, Emma, we're going to have a break from school now. Can you fix Julia's dress? James, can you go and get a Band-Aid and we'll put a Band-Aid on? Can you see I just tackle each one? Because what I found that it seems like it's, ah, you just feel like screaming. But what's that going to do? What's that going to do? How important to keep those laws and early in the morning to surrender all to the great God of heaven. So I humbled myself under the mighty hand of God and I said, Father, I do not want to do that ever again. I am so sorry. So sorry. And what does he say? Freely he forgives us. Oh, did I learn from that. I'm embarrassed to even share it, but I share it because I learned so much from that. And I know that every mother is challenged with this. So when it all happens at once, you almost go, <coughs> look at this. And you know that the devil's there to tempt you. So then you just do one thing at a time. One thing at a time. Just one thing at a time. And you also see what's the greatest need. Maybe that child there has a... Emma, can you take the baby for a little walk? Because it's all over in five minutes. So your words reveal your feelings. You can't let them all out. You cannot. You cannot. The, the proverb said in Proverb 13, verse 3, He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life. But he that openeth wide his mouth shall have destruction. Now, little children don't always remember things. I wouldn't be surprised if none of my children even remember that happened. But, you know, the teenagers do. And you've got to conquer these things while they're little because the teenagers are coming and, whoa <laughs> They study you <laughs> very closely. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's so important. In fact, Ellen White says the home should be like sunshine. A very happy place. So if ever I heard my two children, you know, two children raising their voice, I would run. And when I got to them, I was, what's happening? I'm reacting as if this is a terrible thing. And it is. I don't want any loud voices in my home. I said, what's the matter? He took this. Why did you take that? Well, he did that. Why did you do that? And you take it down, you find out what it is. And of course, it's usually they both want the same toy. Is that right? You can have 500 trucks in the room and they both want one truck. And then you teach them the clock. Okay, you can have it till it goes down to there and then it's your turn. And, you know, in two minutes they don't even want the truck again. And you know what I used to say to them? I used to say, be kind one to another, tender-hearted forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. It's in Ephesians. So that's what I would say to them. That's the first thing that came out of my mouth. And you know, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and he's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It has a calming effect. Well, you know what I'd often do in the kitchen? I would sing hymns at the top of my voice. That has a calming effect. Because there is a roaring lion out there who's going to try and bring dissension into the home. 
I am thankful to God every single day of my life that I'm married to a man and have been for 25 years who has never raised his voice. Oh, I've never seen him angry. That is such a blessing. That, that brings harmony into the home, much harmony. Do we ever have a disagreement sometimes? He likes cement and I like gardens. <laughs> and I have all these nasturtiums and lovely flowers and he's mowing the Lord and I've got my eye on him. <laughs> and I went inside one day and looked out the window and he's looking to see if I'm watching and then he's getting the mower like this. <laughs> and I ran out and I looked like this and he goes... <laughs> And we laugh a lot. They'll grow again. <laughs> it's so important to have laughter in the home. Yeah. And to forgive. Forgive. Even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven us. Yeah. Your words affect your feelings, so be very careful on your words. And it's a lot easier to hold your words if you're keeping those laws and your reins. These are your reins. This is your bridle. But what makes it even more powerful when you surrender that to God? And remember what God said, I will dwell in them and I will walk in them so that our words are his words. Your words reveal your feelings and you can't let them all out and your words will affect your feelings. So be very careful on your words. I read in uh, Child Guidance where Ellen White said, Never praise the children and never praise what they do. And I thought, well, what do you do? And then I read on. She said, what children need is encouragement and they need appreciation. And so I did an experiment on it. So you can imagine our home when Michael and I married. Uh, my son is 10, his daughter is 11, my son is 12. His son is 13, 15, 16, 19, 21. So you've got adolescence there. And his daughter would make him an apple pie. And we've just had our main meal and the apple pie comes. And Marcus said, oh, you are the best daughter in the world. You make the best apple pie in the world. You are just such the wonderful daughter. And she'd go like this, looking at the boys, and the boys would be going, grumble, grumble, grumble. <laughs> and then, of course, later, they go and, you know, put some grass in a bed or, you know, things that boys do, hide her favourite shoes. So can you, see, can you see what happens? Yes. And I was watching all this, and I'd not, not long read that. So maybe two weeks later, another apple pie comes. And she comes out, and before Michael can say anything, I say, thank you for the pie. We so appreciate you making that pie. Thank you so much. And she didn't go. She smiled. And Michael smiled. There was no need for anyone to say anything because I'd said it all. And I didn't see grumble grumble with the boys. And everyone ate their pie and it was happy. And so I remember seeing, wow, what a difference. Yes. So remember with little ones, when you praise them and say, you're the best kid in the world, you know what starts to happen? They start to think, oh, I'm so good, I shouldn't have to do the dishes. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm the best kid in the world. Mm -hmm. but, what, but what they need is appreciation and encouragement. You're doing so well. I love the way you did that. How did you do that? Well, yeah. That's, that's a great idea. See that? God's given you a wonderful gift in that. Mm -hmm. Well done. Can you see that? Number five is the law of adaptation. The law of adap adaptation states that we have a changeable brain. This has only been acknowledged in about the last 15 years by medicine. They used to say our brain was hardwired, set. They call it softwired, neuroplasticity. I've got books on softwired. I've got books on neuroplasticity. But there are proverbs that talked about it. The Bible already talked about it. One proverb is found in um, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, 
but a companion of fools will be destroyed because of the law of adaptation. And the other proverb is found in Proverbs 22, 24. Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare of for thy soul because of the law of adaptation. And the one I quoted before in 2 Corinthians um, chapter 3, for we all with open face beholding in a glass the glory of the Lord, we're changed into the same image. By how? By observing the glory of the Lord. So the more we read about Jesus, the more we'll be like him because it's a law of the brain, that our brain has the ability to grow and our brain has the ability to shrink. So let me begin with a, a very bad growing scenario. A very bad growing scenario is if you have been through heartache and trauma, and I think we all have, every heart has its sorrow, but if you think about it every day, talk about it every day, the fact is it gets bigger than it really is. But something else happens. There's a Christian psychoanalyst. She's written a book called um, Who Switched Off My Brain? Her name's Dr. Carolyn Leaf. And she shows that when we entertain or cherish negativity, thorns grow between the dendrites. Thorns. She said they're physical thorns and these thorns damage the tissue. There's your psychosomatic diseases. And Ellen White says in the Ministry of Healing, grief, anxiety, discontent, remorse, guilt, distrust, all tend to break down the life forces and invite decay and death into the body. So that was written in the 1850s and now current psychologists and scientists are finding that exact thing's happening. So there's your terrible growing scenario. What's a wonderful growing scenario? We can rewire our brain right up until the day we die, like Ben did. He rewired his brain. What's another growing scenario, wonderful growing scenario, is every time we learn something new, we grow another dendrite, another dendrite, another dendrite, another dendrite. I love knitting and I love sewing and I love cooking and I love reading and I love memorizing. And every time I learn something new, I'm growing more dendrites. One nerve cell, we've got one trillion in the brain, one nerve cell has the potential, the ability to grow 70,000 dendrites. I can hardly get my mind around that. Do you remember the quote I gave you before from Christ Objects lesson? The physical organism needs to be carefully preserved and developed. We should constantly be learning new skills. But there are three skills that do this more effectively, or three things, more than any other. One is learning a musical instrument, the other is learning another language, and the other one is memorizing the Bible. In page 90 of Steps to Christ, she says, there is nothing more calculated to strengthen the intellect than the broad ennobling truths of the Bible. If God's word were studied like it should be, men would have a breadth of mind, a nobility of character, and a stability of purpose rarely seen today. God says in Job chapter 22 verse 21, Acquaint now thyself with him and be at peace. Thereby good shall come unto thee and receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth and lay up his words in thine heart. Lay them up there. Lay them up. It's not easy. It's one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. So in November, when I was quarantined for two weeks in one room, my husband said, I thought solitary confinement had been outlawed. <laughs> it hasn't. <laughs> I memorized Isaiah 53. <gasps> what a privilege to be able to memorize such an incredible section. I still have not presented the whole thing in public because, wow, I don't think it's in cement yet. <laughs> I can do a little bit here and there. It's hard work. It's hard work to learn a new language. It's hard work to learn a piano. It's hard work to memorize. Don't give up. Do a verse a week. You might be quicker than me. You might be able to do it more effectively than me. It takes a while.
Yesterday we talked about brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Brain-derived neurotrophic factor is a protein and it stimulates neurogenesis. What's this? This is new brain cells. That's impressive. New brain cells. This discovery was in 1998 because it's always been acknowledged that when that brain cell dies, it's gone, it does not regrow. But in 1998, these scientists discovered the brain-derived neurotrophic factor that stimulates neurogenesis. Praise be to God. And there's a verse that talks about it in the Bible and it's easy to remember. It's Ezekiel 36:36. 36, 36 that the heathen that are left round about might know that I, the Lord God, build the ruined places and plant again that which was desolate. For the I, the Lord God, hath spoken it and I will do it. There are three shockers to the body that will stimulate the release of brain-derived neurotrophic factor. One is fasting. <laughs> and the most... <laughs> The popular way to eat today is time-restricted eating. Have you heard it? Or intermittent fasting, which is eating twice in a 24-hour period, six hours apart. Does this sound like the writings of Ellen White? Yeah. <laughs> it's the most popular way to eat today. So when you eat twice in a 24-hour period, 16 hours apart, that's an 18-hour fast you're getting every 24 hours. But also... You know, a person may fast one day a week or one day a month. Fasting triggers a release of brain-derived neurotrophic factor. The other shocker is finishing every hot shower with a cold, a cold, say the cold shower. I've got some good news. You don't have to have a 10 second hot and a uh, 10 minute cold, you can have a 10 minute cold, hot, and a 10 seconds, 20 seconds cold. Just quick, that's all, just quick. If you can't bear 10, try five, and then build it up, ideally to 30 seconds. So that quick cold, <gasps> you'll go like that, but don't worry about it. We're warm blooded creatures, we never like the cold. So when we dived in the creek yesterday, I'm just so used to it because I do it every day up at the rainforest. But some who weren't used to it hesitated a little bit. <laughs> just do it. They wonder we don't like it. We're warm-blooded creatures, yeah? Yes. Uh, please, if you don't mind, can you say what BDNF stands for? Brain-derived neurotrophic factor. All right, thank you very much. The third shocker is the high-intensity interval training. This is the most effective form of training to get the body up into peak working order. And, these are, and we're going to be looking at this when we look at exercise this coming week. So these are intervals of very high intensity recovery, high intensity recovery. If you're unable to run, you could do it on an exercise bike. Most of the, most of the research has been done on an exercise bike. It's usually about 30 seconds high intensity and you might think, oh, 30 seconds isn't long. You try it when you're running for your life. If I don't count to 30, I don't even get to 30 because at 20, my body's saying that'll do. 25, my body's saying this is getting a bit ridiculous. And by 30, I, <gasps> I'm like, this. this is running up a hill. They're the three shockers that stimulate a release of brain-derived neurotrophic factor. What an amazing body and brain our God has given us. So that's another growing scenario. So what is a um, terrible shrinking scenario? If you don't use your brain cells, you will lose them. Yes, alcohol will kill brain cells. Yes, there are some drug medications that will kill brain cells. But lack of use, lack of use, they die. What's a wonderful shrinking scenario? When we forgive everyone who's ever hurt us in our life, we turn painful past to dust. And when we turn painful past to dust, the pathway to that painful memory shrinks. I was with two sisters down by the... I nearly said creek, lake, okay. yesterday evening. We were there about an hour and a half and 
and we were sharing some painful pasts. <laughs> I shared some pain in my past and you know I haven't thought about it for years and years and years. And the first time it happened to me I, you know, I just sobbed and sobbed. Well I shed a tiny little tear yesterday. The pain gets less. <laughs> It gets less. And it gets less through the power of forgiveness. Forgiveness cuts those chains that bind you to painful past. It gives you wings. It gives you healing. It's still there, but it doesn't continually hurt you. You let it go. That's the wonderful shrinking scenario. And the final law... The final mental law is the law of diversion. And the law of diversion states that when something is so firmly denied as to refuse any hope for it, the brain has the ability to divert to other pursuits. What's the old saying? When God closes a door, he opens a window. When I was in Italy, they said, no, no, no. In Italy, we say when God closes one door, he'll open two. <laughs> Have you found that some of the biggest heartache in your life was actually stepping stones to greater things? Yeah. Yeah. So when I left my mountain home with my six children and just about the clothes on our back because of a very traumatic night where my first husband had got a gun and put the billets in it, it was a very scary night. And the only reason I got out was Sabbath morning was because... He asked me if I would be back and I said no and he said, well, you're not going anywhere and so I said, all right, I'll come back. But I know as a woman it's our prerogative to what? Change our minds. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I'll probably change my mind in the afternoon, which I did. I thought it was the worst thing that had ever happened to me. And I hadn't left before because it was difficult but I thought, but we're about to pick the lettuce. The roses are about to bloom. Where am, where am I going to get seven beds? Where, where am I going to get a washing? It was too big. So I stayed a little bit longer. So never ever say of a woman, stupid woman, why doesn't she just leave? You don't know what it's like. <laughs> it, it's huge. It's absolutely huge. But you know, it was the best decision of my life. <laughs> It was the best decision of my life. I discovered things later that my first husband was into criminal activities. He ended up going to jail. Wow. And I didn't realise when I left that day that I was actually leaving to freedom. Amen. It wasn't until I was out that I realised the prison that they were living in. And I remember talking to a woman who was helping us deal with everything that happened. I said, but you know, he was, he was a very good man. He would do this and this and this. And she said, Barbara, but is that worth all the rest? And I thought, hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it wasn't. But God is so good because Many are the afflictions of the righteous, says Psalm 34, verse 19. But the Lord delivers him out of them all. Isn't that true? So when you're in the middle of that affliction, remember, use your prefrontal cortex to know that God is there, he understands, and you will be delivered. A better land is coming. We can't expect it to be too great here now. But it says in Desire of Ages, I think it's 303, she says, all the way along the road that leads to eternal life are well springs of joy to refresh the weary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and in, isn't this little school a little wellspring of joy? Mm -hmm. And as we sat on the jetty last night, looking at the beautiful scene of that lake and the trees, that was a wellspring of joy. And as we embraced each other and comforted each other in the stories with the heartache, they were wellsprings of joy. Wellsprings of joy to refresh the weary. Let me go through the quote again. And it'll mean more to you now, having looked at the mental laws. 
to transgress his law, whether it be physical or mental or moral, is to place oneself out of harmony with the universe, to invite discord, anarchy and ruin. And I have observed when people implement the physical laws and the mental laws that they experience mental, emotional and spiritual health. And page 127 of the Ministry of Healing, she says, those who are obedient to her laws will reap the benefit in health of body and health of mind. And we see people conquer their depression. We see them get off their medication. We see people conquer their panic attacks. We see people conquer, which is what God wants for each one of us. Because God has said in 3 John 1, 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayst prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. Let us close with prayer. Mm. Father, thank you so much for what you have given us. Mm. Thank you so much for the knowledge of the laws. Mm. Thank you so much for a brain that has the ability to change, be rewired, to be able to retain, to be able to develop. Father, you know each one of us by name, by the amount of hairs that are on our head. You brought us here and you will never leave us. So we thank you and we thank you for hearing our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen.